there's something to be thankful for, isn't it? That God is with us. You may be seated. Well, welcome here, everyone. Um, if you're new or visiting and we haven't met yet, I'm, I'm Dave. I'm one of our pastors here. And uh, I am not very good with languages. I, uh, I made it to French 9, which I think is as far as you need to go. Then I was out. Um, when I got to grad school to do my seminary training, I really wanted to learn Greek and then later Hebrew so I could study the Bible and its original languages. But I had to work really, really hard at these. It didn't come naturally to me. You know, one of the things that we do when we're uh, learning a language or even like in an English class where we're trying to figure out how our own language works, um, we have these simple little sort of grammar and spelling language kind of prompts, these pithy little kind of grammar or, or spelling rules, you might say. They, they help us. Things like I before E, except after E, and then a whole lot of exceptions, right? <laughs> I read the exceptions list this week. I thought, oh man, this English is the worst. Anyways, stuff like that. And we know that grammar is important. We've just been doing a relationship series with young adults, and grammar is important because it's not you. It's your grammar. <laughs> or, you had me at your proper use of your. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. I don't know. Uh, in reality, coming into the Christian faith is a whole lot like learning a new language. It's a totally different way of viewing the world and actually walking out into the world as well. Uh, and, like the purpose of learning little grammar rules, I before E except after C, the point of knowing those grammar rules isn't to have a whole lot of rules in your brain. It's to be able to use the language naturally. Like it's just normal thing you breathe. And the thing you do, whether it's written or, or, or verbal, we're, we're not, we don't learn the grammar rules so that we know a bunch of rules. We know it so we have a good handle and use naturally of the language. In many ways, learning to live Christianly, a life devoted to God, without having to think of all the little tiny grammar rules, so to speak, is sort of the goal, that our character would just be so formed after Jesus that we don't even have to really think about living a Christian life anymore. That's kind of uh, what you might call character ethics, and I, I believe that that's kind of what God wants of us. However, until these things come naturally, these little prompts, Grammar rules, so to speak, are actually not only helpful, they're, they're necessary. In the midst of something that we're struggling with, just a really horrible circumstance that's going on, we need to say things like this to ourselves: Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation. Oh, right. That's, what, that's God's will for me in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm going to do in the middle of this. Memorable grammar rules, you might say, of our faith. As we come to the close of Paul's little letter to the Thessalonians, we need to remember that this is a very young church, a couple months old, less than a year for sure, that it was planted. These are all brand new Christians. And so Paul, as he closes off this letter, he's giving them a series of pithy little rules for life in the faith. Things that will help them to remember what it looks like to live a life of following Jesus in the midst of the difficulties. And you know what? We still need to sometimes revisit those, don't we? I'll be typing away and I'll have to go I before E, except after C. And then all those exceptions. Um, same thing in, in the life of faith. We can come back to these statements, rejoice always. I need to keep coming back to that, don't you? You know, Paul's goal, I think, with this little letter is to see this new little church in Thessalonica grow as a community of hope. A community that's learned to love God and love others and to make that good news known to others. And so as we close this letter, we'll see that Paul's final words continue to help shape the community in that direction. And in fact, they will be shaping us in that direction too. They'll be calling us to be a community that is fueled by the Spirit. A community of holiness, a community of affection, and a community of grace. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. 
God our Father, we thank you that, that you called this little church in Thessalonica into existence by your grace. And you enabled the Apostle Paul to, to have a hand in seeing that planted, and that you inspired him to write this little letter down. And that these words continue to speak your truth to our hearts today. And we ask that you give us hearts that are open to hearing what you continue to speak to us through these pithy little grammar rules of our faith. In Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're picking up on the last section. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, and I'd encourage you to always bring them with you to church. That'd be a good thing. Or your Bible app. Open it up. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verse 19. That's where we'll begin here. And here's where he starts. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So what kind of community are they to be? Are we to be? Let me put it like this. I'd say it's a community that's filled with, led by, under the influence of the spirit of God. We could say that a, a community of hope is, gasp, a charismatic community. Now, some, for some of you, the language of charismatic will cause you like an allergic reaction. Uh, some of you look for the exits. You don't need to do that. It's not going to get that weird. Um, weirder. No. <laughs> that was actually a grammar exam right there. Some of you are thinking, he should have said more weird, not weird. Um, the word charisma in Greek means gift. And of course, God has given his people gifts. Gifts that are meant to be used and encouraged, even stoked up. As Paul writes to the young pastor Timothy, fan into flame the gift, charisma of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands for the spirit God gave you does not make you timid, no. It fills you with power and love and self-discipline. But in our text, what's Paul's concern? Paul doesn't want this Christian community to dampen God's work in them. There's a possibility that they could do the opposite of what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that God has given you through the Spirit. What does he say to the Thessalonians? Do not quench. And that word quench is interesting. The other usages in the New Testament of that same Greek word mean extinguish or to put out a fire. We think about it, the language of quenching or putting out a fire or extinguishing makes sense when you think of how the Spirit is symbolized in the Scriptures. Remember Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. How is, this, how is the Spirit symbolized there? As fire. Right? Okay, some of you get Pentecostals. Where are you? Come on, fire! <laughs> uh, but fire is just a symbol. The Spirit is a person, the third person of the one true God. We confess that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Spirit shows up symbolically in a lot of ways, and one of these is fire. We could put it like this. I think Paul might be saying, don't douse. Don't extinguish, don't dampen down the work of the Spirit in your life or in your midst. But now we need to ask, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Is Paul saying that these folks are putting aside, you know, the so-called miracle gifts? Maybe it's tongues or healing? Or is this about putting aside the Spirit's work of making us holy, of forming in us the fruit of the Spirit, of, of love and joy? Peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So which is it? At this point, when I do my biblical studies work and I get stuck, I like to open up a few different commentaries. And like Morris is excellent on First Thessalonians, and you know, get some really clear explanation. So what does this mean? Do not quench the spirit. I'm reading Morris's commentary, expected, and he says. Exactly what is meant in this case is unclear. I love it when an honest biblical scholar gives an honest shoulder shrug. We don't know. This is a great reminder. There are some passages in the Bible that are like this. 
because Paul is writing the letter to a group of people he knows, and he's addressing a situation that he knows, but we don't. It's like we're listening on the one end of a telephone conversation. We don't actually know all that's going on in, in their lives. And so we need this kind of humility when we're reading the Bible sometimes. Even if it makes us inquiring wine minds want to know sort of people, even if it makes us a bit uncomfortable. But just because there's some issues that we don't have, you know, a hundred percent, you know, certainty of the exact meaning, that doesn't mean that we can't know something. In fact, I think God enables us to know everything that we need to know today. So, what is that? Well, I think the next verse helps us understand this one a little bit. Paul says, do not treat prophecy with contempt. The fact that these instructions are placed side by side probably helps us to understand them. You know, uh, meaning is defined by its context, by the stuff that comes around it. And I think we'll see that in a moment. But first, we also have to ask, what do we know about the Spirit, both from Paul and elsewhere? What is the Spirit doing in his church? Well, the Spirit is gifting the church for ministry within the church and to the rest of the world. Look at the promise he gives his apostles as he prepares to lead them and to send the Spirit. What does he say? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What is the Spirit doing? He's forming us into a people. Notice he doesn't just say the Spirit comes and will enable you to do certain things. No, to be witnesses. The Spirit so shapes us that we can truthfully and faithfully become those who can bear witness through our lives and our words to the grace of God manifest through Christ Jesus. I can get an amen. That's, that's exciting to me. This is powerful stuff. The, the Spirit of God will make us witnesses. Amazing. We need that. But there's a problem. It's a problem for us. It's a problem for the churches actually throughout the century, but maybe particularly for us in the late modern Western world. See, we live in a context today that highly values efficiency, control, and individual autonomy. That, that is the ability to make our own decisions without reference to others. Well, what's the problem there? Well, the Spirit of God is at work. And when we open our lives to the Spirit, that means what? God will do what God wants to do in and through us. Consider what this means with me for a minute. Submitting to the Spirit means I no longer call the shots. It means, gasp, giving up control. Giving over the direction of our lives to the living God. It means surrender to the wild, risky pattern of living that God is calling us to. It's a way of life, by the way, that flies in the face of, of many of the sort of stories, you might say, or I would even go harder than that, the common idols or God's substitutes of our time. Control, security, and comfort. The idea that we really can be our own little gods in charge of our own little kingdoms. This is a safe notion. Yes. We think safe, yeah, because we keep control. We define the boundaries of our existence. It's like the character uh, Elsa. I said Anna in the first service. Oh boy, I can tell I haven't actually watched Frozen, and that was a mistake. <laughs> in her song, Let It Go, yes, we just went there. Uh, I will not sing it. You will not sing it in your head. Okay, the character Elsa is determined that she will no longer be the, the good girl that her family or society want her to be. And so she sings, there's, there's no right or wrong. There are no rules for me. She's, she's a protagonist in the story, right? I mean, she's, she's setting the example in a sense, and all our kids are singing it. <laughs> but I don't think Disney's actually creating a character that's meant to, in any sense, be horrible. Um, they're simply reflecting back to us the propensity of our own hearts. 
the desire to control our own lives on our own terms without reference to God or our community. We can relate to this. They've created a relatable character, and that scares me because I can relate to her. This sovereign self way of life actually makes sense to us. That is, if there's no God, or if there is a God, this God is not really involved in our lives and doesn't make any claim on our lives. Many people believe in a God like that. It just happens to not be the God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, the true God claims the whole of our lives, every single bit. There's one theologian, Daryl Guter, at Princeton Seminary. He defines sin as control. What does that mean? Well, just consider the, the opening chapters of the Bible. Here we find that God gives his image-bearing creatures, humans, only one command, just one. You are free to eat of any tree in the garden, just not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this knowledge that's being spoken of, this isn't just general knowing stuff. Uh, it's not saying that knowledge is bad, oh no. This is a form of knowledge that says to God, I am mature enough to live apart from you, to define my own right and wrong. So to eat of this tree was a way of saying to God, I don't need you. I can be in control of my life on my terms. See, sin is the propensity of our hearts to seek control, to do life on our terms, not God's. And therefore, the sins, with a little S at the end, you know, the, you know, the things that we say or think or do uh, that just are in rebellion to God, they're all just a fallout of sin, capital letters, our selfish, independent nature. So yeah, I can see why Luther says sin is control. But more than that, I can see it in my own heart. I can see this pattern of wanting to take direction of my own life from God to do life on my own terms, and I hate it whenever I see it in me. I hate it because I know that I'm created for so much more and so much better than that. I hate it because actually the Spirit of God is doing a work in my heart that's leading me away from that life and into newness of life in the Spirit. So you see, the biblical story tells us that God, the one true King, is still King even if we've thought we could be our own kings and queens on our own terms. And the true king we find out as the story unfolds is the most humble, gentle, and loving king possible. As we start the Advent season of preparing our hearts for to celebrate the coming of the king, we're presented with images like this of Mary and Joseph. They always look so self-assured in these nativity scenes, but these are scared teenagers, peasants. And we find out if this story is true, God himself is laying right there in a manger, in a feeding trough. That's not exactly the entrance that we'd accept, expect the king of the universe. And as we'll see, this story comes to its climax as this baby, that one, grows into a man and he gives up his life on the cross. Why? Out of faithfulness to God the Father and of love for you. Jesus gave up the notion of directing his own life in the way he wanted. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane. If you know the story, the night before Jesus is betrayed, he gets down on his knees and he's praying and he's sweating and he's saying this, God, I don't want to do it. It's going to hurt too much, not just physically, but in every other way. God, I don't want to do your will but I will. I'll submit myself to your way because I know it's the right way. I know it's the way that will lead to life. So Father, I'll do it. See, instead of self-directedness, Jesus lived in a way that you and I simply could not, in perfect submission to his Father's will. And because of his faithfulness, when we receive God's grace, he makes us into the sort of people who now can Father, the Father, the leading of the Spirit. 
See, receiving Jesus' work for us, giving into God's, his great yes to us will mean giving up my propensity to dig in my heels or stay with Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. <coughs> giving up that way and living for God and by God's grace, this is, of course, what it means to be a Christian. So, let's go back to submitting to the Spirit instead of quenching the Spirit. That doesn't mean, this is important, losing self-control. We know Paul believes that the Spirit gives us the ability to have self-control, actually. He says that to the Galatians. He says that in his letter to Timothy. But the self-control Paul's talking about is the ability to curb our self-centeredness. For example, it's easy to become angry. I struggle with that sometimes, actually. Um, because we can set up expectations for others or on ourselves. And if someone or something steps in and blocks us from that expectation, if they disrupt our plans, that's often where our anger builds. I expect my kids to listen to me when I'm asking them something. So when they don't, anger builds. I expect to get to... I, I expected to get to sit down and actually have a break today at some point, and then my needy friend calls again and they need to come again. And so there's this anger that can build in us. What do I do with that? The anger itself is wrong, but what do I do with it? Lash out? Maybe use a sarcastic comment to bite back? Or do I just kind of stuff it down and pretend it's not there and then just grow bitter on the inside? Or let the Spirit enable me to respond well with maybe helpful communication, maybe communicating a boundary, or letting the other person know what we were expecting or what we were hoping for. Or maybe the Spirit will reveal that we've had fairly unrealistic expectations. Maybe they've even been selfish. Either way, the Spirit can enable us to actually keep our cool, to be self-controlled, to respond with love. So giving the Spirit control, instead of quenching the Spirit or pushing the Spirit down, will mean not seeking to control other people or situations, but being self-controlled in our response, whether it's in painful things or in difficult times. And we'll have the power to do that because of the Spirit where otherwise we wouldn't. So instead of letting bitterness or lust or cowardice or living for my own comfort, the Spirit enables me to curb my self-centeredness and instead, with great self-control, live for God and the sake of others. So Paul says to the Thessalonians, do not quench the Spirit. Through the Spirit, the living God, you see, is made present to us at all times. And the Spirit will call us to live in deeply risky ways. Risky? Yeah, let me explain why. God calls us to love. Love requires vulnerability. The nature of love is ecstatic. It's out from us into the world. When we choose to love somebody, we have to open our hands. We don't know what the other will do with it. Will they reject us? It's out of our control. And so following in the risky way, and that's exactly what the King Jesus does out of love for us. He gives up his life. He dies in our place. He spends it all for us. And it's out there. And it's up to us. He doesn't control our response. The response is now ours. Submission to the Spirit will then mean openness to God, taking us wonderfully to places well beyond as we open ourselves to the empowering work of the Spirit, God will call us to take risks. Maybe it's a coworker that you work with. And this coworker has been saying, just telling you about some of the hard things that she's going through in, in her marriage, maybe or her, with her kids or something. And so maybe the Spirit is prompting you and, and, and calling you to say something like this, you know. Um, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if you believe in God or not, um, but I, would I be willing to over this week just to pray with, for you you know, while I, while I take my time to pray on this weekend, I don't, I don't know how God will answer. I don't know if we'll see any difference, 
but I think that God does answer in his own way. Would, would you mind if I prayed for you this week? Maybe it could be like that. Or maybe you have a coworker and classmate, maybe, and you think that maybe they're ready to step inside these doors on Monday or Tuesday night coming up here to be part of our Christmas event, to hear the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Maybe they're not ready, and the Spirit will help you know that, but maybe they are, and, and you're being prompted to invite them. What are you going to do? Quench the Spirit? No, please don't. Or maybe when you're singing and praising God and in, in, in the worshiping community like this, maybe the Spirit will prompt you just to raise your hands as a sign of adoration to God and surrender to His will and obedience to little instructions in the Bible like raise your hands, 1 Timothy 2 8, clap your hands, shout for joy, some of those things. Maybe the Spirit will prompt you to not be concerned about what others decide you to think and enable you to say, yes, God, I, wanna, I just want to express my love for you in this way. Is that a possibility? Or maybe, now we're on a shaky ground, no, not really, not that weird. If we're open to the Spirit, maybe, purely on God's own terms, He would enable you to pray in a language that you don't really understand, what the Bible calls tongues. And that encourages your own spirit that God is at work in you. Now, I know there are so many different ways uh, and views on how gifts like tongues or prophecy function in the church today. Personally, I don't see any reason from the Bible to say that God can't give certain gifts at certain times to certain people for specific purposes. I think he does, and that he can, and that he does. Do I understand it all? No, I don't. But God, I believe, can do whatever God wants to do. We can't limit that. And it's possible that God will gift some people at some points to boldly speak words of encouragement that come from God. Words that, didn't, that weren't necessarily planned. Words that speak hope and life. Or call someone to turn away from something that could be harmful to them. And it will always be wholly a work of God. Now, that's what Paul kind of says next, doesn't he? Do not treat prophecy with contempt. The word contempt there in the Greek is a really strong word. It could be translated despise. Do not despise the prophecies. Now, Paul isn't saying that the Thessalonians necessarily were doing this, but as sort of a grammar of our faith, as sort of a how do we function in community, he wants them to make sure that they're open to hearing God speak to them as God chooses to. Now, some scholars essentially equate prophecy with preaching today. Uh, I think that preaching can, and actually perhaps it should be, prophetic, if not most of the time, often. You know, when people say, you know, to a preacher after a message, something like, were, were you reading my mail? Or like, are you watching? You know, my life? Because that was directed to me. I heard wow, um, I'm freaked out right now. Sometimes people hear God. I hope that we hear God when we open the text together on Sunday morning. I hope we're open to letting the, the Spirit speak to us through the text, maybe even through the preacher who has waited on this text in prayer throughout the week. Maybe the preacher is aware of it. Maybe sometimes they're not. That's a little bit about preaching and prophecy, but... We have to look at what Paul says elsewhere to understand what he means when he says prophecy. Because it's bigger than just preaching, actually. Look in Acts 21. We read that Paul stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, that probably included both inside the church and outside the church. But we know from 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives instructions on how women would prophesy in the church setting. So... They're obviously not quiet, by the way. Prophecies are out loud things. Just as a little... Yeah, we got to think through that one well. Um, Luke goes on. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, and he tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders will bind the owner of this belt and will hand them over the Gentiles. Brief point. Usually in the Bible, 95% of the time, 
a word of prophecy is for exactly at that moment. 5% of the time, a word of prophecy is about a future event, something that's going to come up, that's going to happen. That's the case in this one. Clearly, Agabus was speaking of Paul's future. Paul still went to Jerusalem, and he was arrested, just as Agabus told him. So what was the point of this prophecy? What was it about? Well, a couple of things we need to hear. Paul didn't reject or despise this prophecy. He believed it, actually. And he even embraced the message and what it meant. His co-workers, if you keep reading, try to talk him out of going, don't go, Paul. And they're crying and they're saying, stay safe, Paul. And he says, no, God is calling me. I'm going. I just know that that's going to happen. So Paul's able to walk into that scenario knowing that the living God is with him even when things go sideways. I think that's why he was told that. They all believe the prophetic word. And this prophetic word wasn't his preaching. Now, as some of you are painfully aware, preaching can easily, or pardon me, not that too, uh, prophecy can often be misused and abused. What do you say to someone when, when they say, well, God told me this? What, what do you say with that? How do you argue with that? Here's what you say, exactly what Paul tells us to do next. He says this, don't treat prophecies with contempt, so we're listening, but test them all. Hold on to what's good. Reject every kind of evil. What does this tell us? It says we, if someone claims to have a prophetic word, have the responsibility to say, oh really? We're told to test them. How do we do that? First, notice that prophecy, as it's spoken of here, is open to the scrutiny of the whole community. Someone cannot be in gossip about this. A prophecy can't come without openness to the whole community being able to scrutinize it. So it can't be something, hey, God told me I'm going to marry you, okay? <laughs> it, it's got to be open to the scrutiny of the whole church to discern if this is a word from God or not. That's the first thing. Can't be a gossip thing. Can't be a private thing. Has to be open to the whole community. Number two. How do we know it's from God? It will always line up with what God has revealed to us through the scriptures. For example, if someone says, I know when Jesus is coming back, I have a prophetic word about that. We just have to look at the teaching of Jesus, and actually Paul, just in the previous chapter, uh, or in previous uh, paragraphs of this own letter, to say, Jesus himself doesn't know when the Father will send him back. So if someone says, um, I know when Jesus is coming, we simply read the Bible, and we say, not even Jesus the Son knows that time. You cannot know that time. Therefore, we reject as deceptive and evil your claim. End of story. If it doesn't line up with the clear teaching of Scripture, it's out. See, what the Spirit will give to the church is only what is good and helpful and healing and uplifting. Now, a word of challenge might actually be painful, but we can tell if it's true and good because of what it calls us to. We can line it up with the scriptures. Every time I've heard what I thought might be a legitimate word of prophecy, it led to Jesus, and it led to something good. A friend of mine, just one example, a friend of mine, Claire, was praying one night at a youth church meeting, and she came to me and was like, Dave, I, I don't know exactly about this, but I think God is saying he's going to use you to lead his people in the future. Be open to that. Simple. It was future-oriented, yes, but it wasn't overly specific. At that time, I wouldn't necessarily have thought that this would be a, even a possibility in my life. That's not where I thought I was at. And yet, this is how God has been working things out for me. It was something I could look back on and, and say, yes, this is actually God's call. And not only was it something that Claire said to me, but it was the church that affirmed that word all through the years. So... Does that make any sense? We're tracking? Okay. Let's, we gotta wrap up here pretty quick uh, on a few more briefer points. The good and bad. Not only does this have to do with prophecy, I don't think. I think Paul is speaking more generally. Just one of the grammar rules of the faith. Hold on, grip what's good. Reject every kind of evil. I like how Leon Morris puts it. He says, if a thing is evil, then the believer must have no truck with it, whatever. No truck. What? <laughs> I was reading that and I laughed out loud. We know what he means though. <laughs> Any form of evil, including 
manipulative speech, including behaviors that Paul has clearly told us to stay clear of, like sexual immorality. Paul spoke of that in 1 Thessalonians 4. Outright, have nothing to do with it. Have no truck with it, whatever. Thank you. I love that. Um, and that actually leads to Paul's next point. A community of hope is a community of holiness. Look at verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify, which could be translated, make you holy through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Now, I realize that that word holiness can carry some baggage for some of us. Like, how many people, when they heard holiness, thought of the phrase, holier than thou, uh, come to mind. Don't, don't put up your hand, actually. Um, holiness is a pretty churchy-sounding word, but what does Paul mean by that? Well, holy is essentially meaning to be set apart for a specific good purpose. Um, if you came over to our house, for example, for dinner, we might pull out the holy dishes and set the holy silverware out. Or maybe if we weren't trying to impress you, we'd just pull out the profane stuff. Um, <laughs> but Paul has been calling the Thessalonians all through this letter to a life of holiness, to saying yes to loving each other and to loving all of their neighbors, even those who hurt them. And he's been telling them to say no to everything that does not line up with the king or his kingdom. But notice what Paul is saying here. Essentially, he's saying, I I've been speaking to you about how to live, and it really matters. Your whole life, spirit, soul, body, every part of you has been bought by God and is now to be lived for him. But just as you came to know God through his grace and his faithfulness, it will still be God's grace and his faithfulness that enables you to now live in this way. My son Adam loves to carry things, anything. It just, he'll be walking around with like an arm load of just like sort of a mix of tools and dog treats and toys, whatever. He just walks around with stuff all the time. But he'll often grab a whole bunch of things and then say, Daddy, pick me up. <laughs> so he's carrying his stuff, but really it's me who's carrying the whole thing. Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, you're like my son Adam. You've got your role. You've got to pick it up. But remember, the Father's going to come and pick you up and carry you. He is faithful. He will do it. Let's rest in that. Doesn't, isn't that great? I love that part. Okay. Last point. A community of hope is a community of affection. Verse 25, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Just turn to the person next to you right now and, and say something like, please don't kiss me. Um, <laughs> I think I'm so funny. Anyways, <laughs> brothers and sisters, pray for me. Pray for me. Translation, you and I are family, and we need each other. I need you. I need your prayers. That's a beautiful thing to ask, isn't it? Like, we might think the Apostle Paul is sort of floating above the fray. Like, he's not in the middle of the junk of life. He is. Here's what Leon Morris writes about his grave. Paul found himself in situations where he didn't know how to act. Me too. And you too. That's why we pray for each other. We need to admit the limitations of our lives. Paul admitted his limitations. You and I need the same to pray for each other. But now we need to wrap up. So let's talk about kissing for a moment. Um, what is that about? Well, if you're from a Mediterranean society, you'll know what it's about. Or from South Africa. If you, uh, if you go anywhere and people kind of receive you and accept you, they'll kiss you on both cheeks. It's a way of expressing affection. Here's what it is. It's a way of saying, I notice you. I acknowledge your presence with us. You matter. Your personhood matters. That's what's holy about it. 
And so, you know, when we ask you at the very beginning of the service to stand up and shake hands with complete strangers, it's not just so that you'll feel awkward. <laughs> and it's not, it is not just so that we can watch you feeling awkward from up here, as fun as that is. <laughs> this awkwardness is there because we live in an individualist society. Where, where we're meant to kind of have our few, our little tribe, and everyone else is sort of the other. Yet Christianity says, no, that's not how things are going to work. The point is we need to acknowledge each other. I love when Paul says, greet all God's people. All. None are excluded. None are left out. Um, last week, uh, I was chatting with a couple after uh, after the service, and, and one of the young ladies said to me, um, you know, I came here without my husband um, a couple times because he was out, away on, on, on business or out, out of town, and it was a really lonely experience. <sighs> my heart sank when she said that. That is never what we want people to say about coming to a service at Summit Drive. It's a lonely experience. It broke my heart. But then she said this. She said, "I, you know, then I realized I could have engaged with other people. Maybe others were feeling the same way. Or when I'm here with somebody, like my husband, maybe I need to be taking the initiative to engage those who don't look engaged yet. That, that's what Paul's talking about here. You notice the command isn't, wait for someone to give you a holy kiss. The command is puts the onus on each of us. Greet one another. Every one of us is responsible to do that. We are called to create a community of affection here. Um, a few months ago, Harry uh, and I were sitting in his office, and we were, we were talking about some business stuff, and you know, Harry started to get some tears in his eyes, and he looked at me and said, Dave, I love you. I love your work here. I love working with you. Thanks for what you do. And how many workplaces does your boss say that to you? <laughs> but notice, Harry could have felt that way. He could have thought those things, but I would never know unless it was expressed. After staff meeting this Wednesday, we had read this text, and just as Lana was walking out the door, she stopped herself, and she looked back and said, I love all of you. And then she carried on her way, okay? And we might think, wow, that's kind of, oh, that's interesting staff meetings you guys have. Yeah, it is, that's good. But notice, this actually isn't exceptional. That is normal Christianity according to Paul in the New Testament. That's how a church is supposed to be. Greet each other with signs of affection. That's what the handshake is for. It's a physical connection. Eye contact. I notice you. You matter. You belong. God is forming us as a community of hope, a community of affection, of wholeness, of being led by the Spirit, a charismatic community. I'm going to invite the... Uh, worship team to come forward at this point um, and those who are serving communion to come as well we're going to wrap up on this very last very short point as i was writing this week um, a song came on my itunes library it's just i was just writing and it was just on my library there it's called through and through by will regan and the chorus words are are really very simple um, it says you see me and you know me and you love me through and through. You know, as we come to the table this morning, I think we come with that longing to be fully known, warts and all, and still fully loved. That's what the Bible calls grace. It's God demonstrating his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to make us new, to make us his. Paul began the letter saying grace and peace to you. He ends the letter saying God's grace be with you. God is reaching out to us, knows us fully, and yet loves us through and through. So now as we come to the table, we see the elements, the broken bread, the cup that represents Jesus' blood that was shed and here's what these elements are saying to us today. They remind us. The fact that Jesus had to die reminds us that our sin is really serious. 
that it cuts us off from God, that God himself would have to die to make things right. That's how much our sin actually is a crushing weight to us and excludes us from the presence of God. This is a big deal. That Jesus had to have his life pulled apart to put us back together tells us, boy, we need his grace. But that Jesus died for us tells us we are so loved that he thought we were worth it. Just sit with that for a minute. As we reflect on the table, we also realize that these symbols here, though they reenact Jesus' death, that death could not hold him. That God the Father raised his son from the dead and will one day restore all things. Put things back together as they should be. And so as we take this, it's an anticipation of God's renewal of all things. If you have said, yes, I receive your grace today, Lord, then this is for you. And if you haven't, let me ask you a question. What is standing in your way? Why not surrender your life to the loving leadership of Jesus? Let's take a moment and pray as we prepare our hearts. Lord, we thank you that the only true freedom we can know is the freedom of living in you and according to the leadership of your spirit. We thank you that by your grace, you enable us, you empower us to actually do it. Yeah, we'll mess up at times, but you are the one who will accomplish your good purposes in making us holy and seeing us through. We give you thanks this morning for for the reality, Jesus, that you gave your life for us to make us your own. We rest in that today. We celebrate.